Welcome to The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpy, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and columnist who has over a million listeners around the world. His podcast and YouTube show draws guests and audiences across the political spectrum. Hello and welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy. I hope everybody had an outstanding Thanksgiving. Uh, it's actually a very unifying holiday that we celebrate in the United States. Uh, and for my listeners uh, internationally, uh, we extend to everybody the best wishes for Thanksgiving and this upcoming holiday season. Um, we have a great guest with us today with some very real world experience. Um, she's uh, a very articulate contributor to journals of the day. Um, she brings a perspective from uh, China and from the United States. Uh, so we welcome to the Common Bridge today, uh, Javi Chung. And please forgive me if I need to pronounce your last name better. There's nothing to be forgiving. Uh, just to call me Javi. The, the last okay, name Javi, is well, Yeah. Welcome to the Common Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, our listeners like to know a little bit about the people that appear on the Common Bridge. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were your early years spent and you know, what kind of things have you done for work and your family and education? Uh, okay, I, I'll see if I can give a succinct uh, uh, description of my life. Uh, I may fail, we'll see. Uh, so I was uh, born and raised in a very small town in the Sichuan province of China. And that is really poor. And I, my parents, uh, they were illiterate and uh, struggled their whole lives to to put a three meals a day through a series of menial jobs. And uh, so that's my household background. And I spent my first 18 years um, in this small town before I uh, went to another province for college. Um, uh, and after college, I was just uh, um, working as most other people on the streets. And uh, fast forward to um, 2015, I was uh, admitted to the School of Public Policy in Pepperdine University. And uh, that really uh, the, is the beginning of my of my life and my schooling in America. So and and where so you're at Pepperdine and now I understand you're at Purdue University completing Correct. a doctorate. Yes. Well, congratulations. That's a uh, remarkable uh, and very uh, accomplished academic career. Um, so you've you've had experience uh, both in uh, China as well as in the United States. And I understand you have a child as well. Correct. Okay, and he's a five-year-old? Eight years uh, old. Eight years old, okay, yeah. great. Um, and one of the things that you've written about recently is how much Beijing or mm -hmm. the Chinese Communist Party really loves the fact that the United States of America is undereducating our children. Um, can you tell us about that? What, I, that was, I thought, a very mm -hmm. unique perspective. Um. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, the Beijing, the CCP, they've been um, closely monitoring the U.S. for decades. And I think um, more evidence emerging in recent years of how the CCP has been able to infiltrate into all these major uh, cultural, societal institutions in America, such as university, think tanks, and government, and Hollywood and the sports, you name it. And so they truly understand uh, everything is happening in America. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, there are two remarkable features of the American educational system, in my view, that has been seriously wrong. The first is that uh, they've been lowered the standards, academic standards for students in the name of um, protecting their emotional well-being and or to, to provide for a equity for all students. So they, they are not really, um, they do not put um, uh, teaching or training uh, in skills upfront. 
instead, uh, they, um, they, 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 I mean, from elementary school all the way to higher in higher learning of institutions, uh, institutions of a higher learning, they've been really uh, just uh, the, the, just the color. I think the color is the best word to describe um, the the actions, the measures they've been taking, just to coddle students, trying to protect them and uh, lower the burdens and this and that. This is one thing they've been doing. And the second thing is that, um, as we have seen for the past few years, um, elementary schools all the way to college, they'll be indoctrinated kids about, you know, all those wokeist ideologies, such as anti-racism anti -racism or white America is in, inherently racist to CRT, and uh, this and that. So I guess um, the the gist of my piece that being published in Wall Street Journal is that in both countries, kids, young, the youth have been indoctrinated politically. Uh, so in China, kids are being indoctrinated uh, with those uh, jingoistic nationalism. And in America, and so uh, kids are being indoctrinated all those anti-American ideologies. But the difference is that in China, at least the students, they are learning something. They're learning some important subjects such as math, such as physics. So they've been really being hard on students. They have a high, very, very high academic standard for kids. So in the future, those kids, they, they, they might, yeah, they might be uh, politically brainwashed, but at least they have some life skills. They can do some jobs. Whereas in America, I mean, so they've been indoctrinated into all those ideologies. And meanwhile, they're not really learning something important. So they, you, you, you put these two things together. They, this is in, indicates a scary future. It, it, it does. Now, I've had some experience with uh, urban schools in America, mm -hmm. and it broke my heart that young children or you know young adults were being graduated from high school that were functionally illiterate they didn't have a sufficient reading comprehension yeah. um, basic computation skills uh, and certainly writing and speaking uh, were things that were lagging uh, behind and now i hear well your parents were not literate and, and perhaps they were in the countryside but how do things differ today? What would a, a young student going to school in a rural area of China or in a major city like Shanghai or Beijing experience? And perhaps how would that compare to the United States? Uh, so your question is, um, so first in China, how um, uh, is uh, education? Sorry, I'm not sure I quite understand. How, how is education today? If your parents were not educated at all, and today, what would a Chinese student mm -hmm. expect? And would it differ if it was in rural China or if it was in uh, one of the major cities? I see. Um, so, I, uh, so China um, uh, re, uh, revived uh, uh, college uh, education in 1978 or 1980. I mean, just uh, shortly after Mao died. I mean, for that, I mean. Nobody really went to school, and so yes, yeah, since then, and um, the um, all kids, all uh, all school aged kids, they are required man mandate. That's a mandate from the the government. All school aged kids must go to school, and so I think um, I did not really research on that. I don't know the status, but I think my generation and of and onward, those kids they. But on average, um, they receive um, much, much more education compared to our uh, uh, parents, the generations of our parents and grandparents. Uh, that's one thing. And the second is that, you know, this uh, educational inequality in China is just mind boggling. And so, uh, of course, I mean, all those, the best financed resources, be that education, be that healthcare, this and that, they all concentrated in urban cities, in major cities, Shanghai, Beijing, whereas in rural areas, and the, the, the quality of education received is just mind-boggling, mind-boggling, uh, uh, inferior compared to uh, the things um, the kids uh, living in urban city receive. Just to give you a one small example from my experience, um, 
so my mother tongue is not a Mandarin. So because I'm from Sichuan province and we have our own dialect. And so we, uh, we kids go to school to learn how to speak Mandarin. How to, uh, and, uh, you know, I remember my uh, Chinese teacher in my elementary school, he couldn't even speak Mandarin. And so um, you can you can see the, the quality is just shockingly low. And I remember, so for my generation, kids started to learn English in middle school. And uh, my teacher, my English teacher could barely speak a sentence uh, of English. And so that just gave you a small um, uh, glimpse yeah, of the, and, the education inequality. Yeah, and um, Mandarin, of course, is the native tongue of more people in the world than any other language. Um, I think it's an essential skill. And yet, uh, very, very few North Americans speak uh, Mandarin. Um, although China is, you know, quickly uh, b becoming competitive with the United States as being the largest economy in the world. Um, now, you wrote in one of your recent columns about the experience of your son in school in China and then in the United States. And can you tell our audience about that? Mm. So my, my son, um, he completed two years of uh, elementary school in Chengdu, the capital city of Sichuan. And uh, yeah, so compared to my generation, uh, I think uh, kids today, they are, um, um, how should I put it? So their, their school workload actually is lower than my generation because for the past two decades or 10, or, or 10 years, um, the the government they are trying to lower the burden, the academic burden of students, because uh, they realize that the this uh, pedagogy of rote learning is not really working very well. I mean, so Chinese kids they can only do they can they can score very high on, on tests, but uh, they 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 don't have the ability to think. They they are not they 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 can they are very, they are not uh, creative and uh, they sorely lacking in imagination. And so there are many, many downsides that has been noticed. And so the government has been taking measure to counter that uh, downside. So they've been lowering the workload of, of kids, especially elementary uh, school, uh, elementary school uh, students. Still, I, I noticed my son, I mean, yeah, he spends lots of time uh, working on his uh, schoolwork every day. And the school starts. Uh, let me let me think. School starts at seven or um, something like that. So um, and then ends at five thirty or six. So he still spends lots of time in school. I may be wrong about the the the, the, the times, but okay, I have to check on that. Uh, and also the um after he comes back to uh, come come back home and uh, he spends lots of time doing homework. And they are just uh, yeah. I mean, compared to is that in, 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 in China, he was in, doing more China. homework or less homework than the um, United States. Oh, uh, much more, much more. Yeah. Uh, and so just to compare to uh, this, the workload here, I mean, yeah, it was much, much more in, in Chengdu. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also what, in, in what, what type of school is he going to today in the United States, but a um, public school or public a private school? school? Yeah. Pro public school. And is it third grader? Yeah, third grade. And and what do you notice about his homework assignments and compare that with what his homework assignments were like in China? Could you be more specific about that? Question? Yeah, it's uh, uh, one, I think if I understood the column that you wrote, uh, that his uh, math requirements, for example, uh, that he has in the third grade today, um, it was about what he was learning as a five-year-old in China. Um, yes or no. Uh, so, um, yes. Okay. So the yes part is that, um, in, uh, elementary school kids, um, they are, they are, um, they are learning more math, uh, much more math compared to the, uh, the, the American kids with the same age or with the same grade. But okay, so it, actually, it was me who taught him um, fraction at the age of five, and uh, but still in school, I mean, uh, 
how do I okay how do I put it in English okay I'm sorry I'm not very <laughs> I'm not verbally fluent <laughs> I write much much better than I speak um yeah so I think um just in Hattie's words um he realized oh th those uh, math problems are so easy because I've already learned it in my first grade in China and now I mean they're learning the same thing Hattie had learned in first grade in Chengdu um, they are just um, exceedingly um, easy for um, for for Hati. yeah. So I um, guess the the the, the, the message, yeah. Sorry, let me let me just just emphasize one thing. I think the the message um, is that um, Chinese schools today they are still very demanding academically on 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 kids. They 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 expect kids to learn. Uh, in terms of academic subjects, they ex they expect kids to learn more and um, yeah, just much more and than here. Make sense? It does, and mm -hmm. and you're you're doing a great job explaining that. Uh, your English is great, mm -hmm. um, so um, this is really fascinating for people in the United States. Um, when your son brings home work or you uh, from his American school, is it academics or is it more social uh, shaping than China? What do you mean by social shaping? Uh, for example, um, uh, there's a term of art now called equity. Um, oh, okay. And that we seem to be teaching a lot of things about equity mm -hmm. and what did your son learn in China about equity and what does he learn in America about equity? No, I mean, in China, we don't talk about equity. I mean, we, do, we don't even talk about equality. Uh, China is just a, it is a brutal um, competitive society. Um, there are two things going on in China. It's extremely meritocracy, but 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 you have to put that into perspective, into a into a context that um, in China uh, there is also a massive um, institutionalized privilege. So by that I mean the party members, their families. They obviously they just uh, share um, better and more uh, resources compared to the other common people. So for common people, there is just a brutal com competition going on among those people. But if you are born into a households, so your your parents are, are party members or working or government officials, and uh, yeah, you have a much much easier pathway to success by that. They mean money. Um, so so we we don't talk about equity or equality um, in China. And here, um, amazingly, and uh, I before I registered him to the school, I was thinking about maybe um, the school would teach CRT. Amazingly, the school seems not teaching CRT. And uh, um, so far, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm I think I'm happy about uh, uh, the school. At least they are just not going crazily to the left and just uh, teaching kids all those nonsense. Those um, those uh, statements that are unpro unproven and also unprovable. Um, so there's, I don't know, there's no not much social learning uh, in terms of uh, homework. Um, yeah, so each day Hadi comes back home with um, just a one piece of paper of math homework and that's it. So it's, it's always, it always takes him just one minute to finish all those <laughs> math homework, yeah. But that's just a math. Well, and, and, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. And may, maybe that maybe that's okay uh, for an eight year old. Um, you mentioned that the elites, the party, mm. that those people have a special status. And one of the things that we've had in America is that the public schools and standardized tests mm. were a way for a student not born to privilege, not born into the the party elite. Would, ha would be able to show they could advance. Mm -hmm. um, 
the United States now is starting to do away with standardized testing, mm -hmm. uh, do away with measurements of mm -hmm. skills. Yeah. And it seems that you're saying that a person in China who can demonstrate that they're good at math mm -hmm. uh, could perhaps earn themselves a bigger opportunity. Am I hearing that right? Correct, correct. But also, we should keep this in mind if you were born in a rural area. And uh, as you can imagine, so the, the education, the quality of edu the education you receive, it just, uh, um, it's just uh, exceedingly inferior to the, to the, the kind of education a, a person born in uh, cities would receive. So, yes, so as I said, so the, there are, I think there are two layers. One layer is that yeah, it is meritocracy. If you can demonstrate you're good with, with math and you, you would go to a, the, the, the first tier universities such as Tsinghua University, Pe Beijing University. So that's the, the one layer. And also the, another layer is that because there's a mind boggling um, inequality of resources. So the chance for, for a rural kid, I mean, it's just exceedingly lower than the chance uh, uh, urban kids would, uh, would have. Is there, if a, if a rural kid can demonstrate on their testing that they're ready, will they be able to go to that elite yeah. university? Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, today in, in the United States, we've had people on our show that talked about that standardized tests did give uh, children from lower economic areas a chance. Um, but now that we've, we have many universities in the United States now are taking away standardized testing as a way to measure readiness for college. Um, and also they're starting to discriminate based on ancestral heritage. Today in America, should there be special accommodations for a person of Chinese heritage? That's a very good question. Um... It's hard. I mean, uh, for people on the left, they are talking about um, re is, how do you pronounce that word? Retro reparations. Reparations, just to, to compensate for the past wrongdoings, and uh, because of the past wrongdoings, and everybody they don't have the really the the same uh, starting point. I mean, mm -hmm. that argument certainly has some merits, and as you can imagine, right? But the, then the 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 challenge is that so how, to how, how far past we should we should attribute we should put this uh, uh, the starting point. I mean, um, each one each I think each uh, ethnic group they all have a certain disadvantage over the different uh, phrase, uh, phrases of history, and so how do you calculate that? How do you even measure that? And so I don't I don't. Even though that argument has certain merits, but I just don't see how we could make a policy based on that argument. Um, so that's one thing. And a, a second counter to that argument is that I think um, societies, there's always a certain amount of unfairness in society. If you really want to correct every ounce of unfairness, in the end, you just have a totalitarian state with the person or a group in the central just uh, distribute every resources equally. But uh, do you really think we would have a philosopher king who is so so benevolent and so um, committed to uh, fairness in society? I, I don't I don't think so. Um, and uh, uh, so that's the second counter. Um, and uh, and so and then the third one is that we, when we started really treat people as in as a member of a group instead of individual, and then we start to give people certain give groups certain um, special treatments. Um, the, I, I think that the harm is would uh, outweigh the benefit of doing that. Um, I, I cannot really think of more details, but, but I think that's, that's my stance. And go back to your earlier question about if I think a Chinese group should 
be given certain、um, advantages or special treatment? Um, I I, I can certainly I cannot speak for for the other Chinese Americans, but I doubt that would be、uh, something the majority of Chinese Americans would want. You know, most of them immigrated to America because. Precisely because、um, there is a equality of opportunity in this country, they 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 fully understand、uh, there won't be equity, there won't be perfect equality, or everything. But they appreciate this opportunity of equality, so that they can make something of themselves. Because this, just go back to the the something I've just mentioned in China. I mean, the 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 institutionalized privilege for the party members for people born into a. Better household is just、uh, that. Just、uh, um, it's insane. Well, here at least they they、uh, if you can demonstrate it, there is a much much more、uh, opportunity of equality. And、uh, as in terms of myself, no, <laughs> you know I think、um, my skin color is the most superficial character about myself. And is the least thing is the least indicator of who I am. I, I you know, for those uh those uh identity politics adherents, I just find it is so so bizarre and stupid. Let me just prove it stupid for them to think that one person's、uh, most superficial character, such as gender or、uh, or skin color. What else or sexual orientation? Those are the most most superficial characters. I'm saying how they think those characters can define a person who he is. Isn't that just so stupid? Yeah, that's well. Are there safe spaces on university campuses in China? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> We we don't do that. I mean, that's why so many young、um, Chinese. I mean, those、uh, netizens, like internet citizens, right? They 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 love making fun of those、uh, Baijiu white leftist. They love. They just、uh, they they think those everything here going on is just、uh, hilarious. It's just insane, crazy, stupid, hilarious. And.、Um... What about the use of different pronouns? Is that something that Chinese <laughs> universities are spending time on? No, no, no. I mean, th- th- those are so frivolous, and somehow they those are frivolous、um, picayune debates.、Oh, gosh, this is just a virtual signaling.、Um, honestly, I just I, I'm not sympathize with with those people who. Who into a virtual signaling by putting a label on the chest? Okay, my profound pronoun is this and that as to, as demonstration of my compassion for people um cert, people of certain groups. That's just、um, frivolous. Pick, uh, I don't know how. To, okay,、well, I, I try. I, I'm trying not to be mean, but <laughs> yeah, let me just well, just get it. You, you've you've had a unique experience. And so you've got a view. Let me ask this question. This is a very difficult question. It's one that we're struggling with in America. So the question is this: If the United States is going to be an open and free society, how do we achieve racial equality? How do you achieve racial equality? I don't know. I so first you have to really define what you mean by racial equality. Every well, racial groups have the same outcome. Is that what you mean by racial equality? If that if well, that is oh sorry you go ahead.、Um, no, well there are people that ad- that advocate exactly that way. That they say that w- we must have.、Um, Racial inequality because not everyone has the same thing. And so, and, sorry, go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. I I was cutting. So so I, so I want to just try to get, if we if if we're an open and free society, how do we achieve racial equality? So for those people who think for them, if they think、uh, racial equality is. Every racial groups have the same outcome. If that's their definition of racial equality, and then there, 
wouldn't be any room for individual autonomy. There wouldn't be any room for individual freedom. And just you have to really take into account that um, the outcome is de is decided by so many other factors, not just uh, your skin color. That's the least uh, contributing factor. I mean, the uh, the outcome is decided by your choice, your individual choice, and your in the environment you 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 grew up, your your parents, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, there are so many other factors other than your skin color. I, I, actually, I don't think skin color really plays a, a major role. I don't think skin color plays, plays a, a significant uh, role in, in deciding a person's outcome. Um, if, if it does, uh, it must be on the very bottom of the list. Um, so yeah, so if you really want every group have the same outcome, then there are there's just no room for individual autonomy. And in the end, you just you really have to have a totalitarian state that uh, mandate everything and um, constantly uh, redistribute resources in society. I mean, I'm emphasizing constantly. Um, and then just uh, yeah, shifting some something away from some groups and to, to other groups, they think uh, as long as they see there is some uneven thing, but that would that would happen. I mean, this is um, how do you? I mean, just a, a simple question: How does the state could really um, um, prevent person people to make um, their free free choice? There's just no way you can do that. Yeah. So let let me ask you this. Um, Many students from China come to the United States for their higher education. Why is that? That's a good question. Um, so I don't know if it is still be the case today or it will be the case in the future. But in the past, I think this is a fact that America offers a much better higher education than China does. Because, um, I mean, um, uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, you know, those this pedagogy of road learning, um, they really um, kills uh, the, 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 the imagination and uh, creative thinking, critical thinking. Um, so I think uh, we have decades of evidence demonstrating that Chinese kids, they are very good at scoring high on standardized tests, but they're not creative. And the Chinese as a nation has seldom made uh, much uh, innovations in, in the uh, 20th century. And so, so yeah. yeah, yeah I, and I think I would agree with that, that the innovation um, and great breakthroughs from, you know, pharmaceuticals to technology to uh, transportation have evolved from the United States. Uh, and evolved from our free and open and uh, merit-based system. And once we all try to become the same, there's no place for a Bill Gates. There's no place for a Steve Jobs. Uh, there's no place for the founders of Google um, because they would be considered to be outliers or heretics. Uh, Javi, if I may ask you a personal question. You chose to emigrate from China. There's 185, 190 countries in the world. Why did you pick the United States and not pick some other country? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good question. Nobody has ever asked me that. Um, yeah, this just uh, goes back to... Um, the book I mentioned, actually, I wrote about it in several of my essays. Uh, at the age of 16, I encountered this book. Uh, it's about, it's a chatting about America. It's a, it's a obs obscure book written by a bunch, a few, uh, three obscure scholars. So they visited America in the 1990s and then they wrote about this book. 
So um, in that book, I really just encountered a world that is drastically different from the world I grew up in China. And so that book act, um, talks about education, school, uh, media, and this and that. Um, at least in that book, the America I had learned uh, at that age is is a lively country, um, um, staring, and uh, um, it encourages um, students uh, to think for themselves. So, like independent thinking and also critical thinking. They encourage students to challenge conventions, to challenge authority. Um, yeah, and so I think the conclusion uh, drawn from that book is that uh, what makes America uh, America today is these all those uh, um, this values um, uh, America as a nation has long been has long cherished until now. Those values like uh independent thinking and the, and the be bold, dare to try and uh, do not fear of losing and this and that. So yeah, in a word, I, I was just uh, blown away by that book. I mean, everything in that book, everything in America, everything about America in that book is just uh, completely different from the world I grew up. So yeah, I just, from since then, I just, uh, I had a yearn for going to America to receive a what I call traditional liberal arts education. So education is not about memorizing and uh, scoring high in standardized tests. Instead, ed- liberal arts education um, is about. Um, so, so let me let me put it in this way. So education, the Chinese word education, in its Latin roots is is lead out. So my understanding of liberal arts education is to. Uh, lead out, lead to lead this your soul out of darkness towards light. To understand, to know, to seek truth. If I if I could put it in that way, yeah. So since then, I just uh, I I had a yearn to go to America to study, uh, to receive a a a good classic liberal arts education. Um, and then that, um, that yeah. Uh, okay, I was, so that's a very powerful statement about the foundations of the United States. It has been about freedom. It has been about seeking your own way. It has been about achievement. Um, Now, we have not been a perfect country. I don't think anybody's been a perfect country. No country's been perfect. Um, Though it seems to me, we spend a great deal of time caricaturing America in who we are versus a, a just a clear-eyed look at history and things we've done to improve things and to consider what we need to improve in the future. Uh, but we need great people like you and people coming from all over the world to join the United States. And I look and I, I see with great satisfaction that people of all colors, people of all nationalities come to the United States for that promise. And I also read in your writings and I hear in your voice the fear that we could lose that by becoming locked into one way of thinking. And and that's why we do this show. It is fiercely nonpartisan that we welcome voices from across the political spectrum, and we've had them and we'll continue to do that. And we'll also be calling out the media news reporting groups that are doing their best to divide us. And that we need to keep in mind that there are more people like you who see the promise of America versus the mistakes that we've made. Hobby, um, I, I want to go back a little bit, if I could, to the students in the United States mm-hmm. compared with students in China. And, and it's about suicide. Mm-hmm. And if you know, is a student more likely to be suicidal in China under all that pressure 
or more likely to be suicidal in America? Oh, this is hard to say. Um, the, um, the suicide uh, rate among youth, among students in China is actually quite high, but we don't know the real numbers and no real numbers would ever be exposed to the world from China. Um, so, but the contributing factors behind those suicides are quite different. So in China, um, you know, most students, um, they, they, they commit they committed suicides is because of this pressure. This pressure is uh, coming from school, coming from society, coming from parents are just, uh, it's just unbearable. And uh, so, yeah, here, um, I, th- I it's, it's the different, um, there, there's not that much pressure. Not not that um, not that much um, uh, uh, pressure to students, and uh, on the other hand, I mean, yeah, I've, we've seen lots of reports and uh, data suggesting that many many young kids they feel uh, depressed, lonely, isolated, and had all those mental issues. And of course, the contributing factors must be multifaceted, and there are just so many. Um, uh, I, I guess I can just name a few. I mean, social media is a huge contributing factor, and uh, I, I, I don't know why people. Are so no, I, and I, I do know why, but I actually I've been thinking about if there's any a day people can be afraid from social media. And I doubt that would happen. And uh, uh, I, I don't use social media. And I, actually, I despise social media. I, anyway, so that's another topic, another conversation. So yeah, indeed, social media. Indeed. Yeah, social media. So, so that, that really um, takes people away from real life, from real human personal interactions with others. And uh, instead, they are just, uh, they are um, spend all their life Glued to their devices, you, you can imagine that that alienation that um, um, that would, you can imagine that the psychological impact of that kind of alienation to a to humans, let alone young kids. So social media is is a, is a huge contributing factors, and also there are other things going on. Um, I think um, this roots is deeper. Uh, American society for the past few decades have been really um, infantilizing the young generations, just coddling them. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they don't want the kids to, to, in, to experience some challenge or difficulties. Instead, the parents, school, they do everything to protect them from being, from, from perceived harms or even challenges or difficulties. I, I don't understand why, um, American society somehow developed this um, mindset that we should protect kids to the best ability. Um, you just think about it. You're, if you um, this, that, that this this is this would do real. Okay, let me put it in this way. If we want the kid to grow up, to grow well, the humans must. Uh, experience challenges, difficulties, and otherwise uh, we, would, uh, we would be, uh, to, we, if we live in a completely protected environment, um, um, protecting us from all those harms or difficulties, and uh, the outcome is this person would become just uh, fragile and uh, brittle um yeah so i guess another sorry that i was meandering i guess no no let me, let me say this about that hobby i think you're very articulate and <laughs> my experience that successful people often talk about their greatest challenges the times they thought they were going to fail the times they did fail Uh, Henry Ford famously went bankrupt several times before he figured out how to build a car at a profit. 
um, Thomas Edison, uh, just, you know, to do his inventions, tried over and over again. Um, Steve Jobs was one that said, no, we can do better and constantly pushed. Um, I know myself in uh, my career back when I was working, um, it wasn't fun at the time, but the, the hardest parts when you were living in terror that you weren't going to make it. Um, those were those challenges. And along with those challenges was the freedom to fail, that you could take chances. And if you took the risk, and you could be richly rewarded. Uh, also, you could you know, go bankrupt if you didn't play it right. But that's really what I think inspires humans. And your conversation today has been very inspiring for me. Uh, I believe our listeners and viewers will get much from this. I hope that you'll consider being on our show again. Um, and is there any closing thought that you'd like to share with our listeners and viewers before we sign off today? Um, yeah, just to, just on the note of failure. Um, I now recall a conversation I had uh, just months ago with a clearly a liberal or progressive, progressive liberal, um, probably uh, of your age, 50 or 60. He said, uh, we, 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 we shouldn't uh, put kids in a situation he will fail. But then I thought, no, why not? I mean, f um, failure is just, uh, we must fail so we can succeed. And and, and as you just uh, put it uh, adequately, yeah, I mean, without a failure, then we wouldn't be able to succeed. So I just don't understand the mindset. We, we don't want, we don't want to, we don't want sh wish to see kids to fail. Um, failure is just uh, a essential step in one's growth. Without failure, we wouldn't be able to succeed in anything. Yeah. I, I think that's very well said. Um, if we don't fail, we don't know what we're not good at. Um, you know, by way of example, I know I could never make a living um, in any kind of art form. Um, I tried it you know, just because we got that in school, but it was pretty clear that wasn't where my talents were. Um, and so I, I, I love that as a closing comment. Uh, Javi, you've been a great guest on the Common Bridge. Uh, Common Bridge is available worldwide on most podcast outlets and directories. Uh, also on YouTube TV, Richard Helpy's Common Bridge YouTube channel. And with that for today with our special guest, uh, Hobby Chang, this is Rich Helpy signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Remember to rate us, review us, and comment about what you heard today and recommend us to your friends. Visit us at richardhelpy.com and sign up for special promotions. This broadcast was produced by Stunt3 Multimedia and is available on YouTube and all podcast directories. All rights are reserved by Richard Helpy.